The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It is episode 252. It is our 2020 Thanksgiving Spectacular. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things to be thankful for here on the first and only wrestling podcast and the sixth and only seventh, maybe? We've done a lot of these Thanksgiving Spectaculars, folks. That's my point. It's it's the seventh. It is in fact the seventh. So we usually have a gimmick for these shows. This year's gimmick is good workers, bad matches. We each picked five good workers and our personal choices for their five worst matches. And um, would you like me to begin or would you like to begin? Why don't you kick us off? All right, let me grab my notes, and we have. All right, so I'm going with uh, with Randy Savage first here. Obviously, great worker. Awesome. Uh, his, his stuff holds up very well. Um, he wrestled. We were uh, kicking around the idea of doing a uh, a Marcho Bandas tournament uh, earlier this year, right before. We all went into lockdown and all that stuff, but anyway. We also considered calling it the What Up Match Madness <laughs> Tournament. Something like that. Be a man, Hogan. <laughs> uh, so we watched a bunch of Randy Savage matches, and Randy Savage versus George Steele, and really just need to pick one. They wrestled each other like five times on national television in late 1986, or all through 1986, really, and into 1987. And all of these matches were abysmal. George Steele was a million years old. <laughs> he couldn't do a damn thing in the ring. And Randy Savage is out there just trying to ping pong around and make these matches work. And all of them suck to various degrees. So Randy Savage versus George Steele, take your pick, is my first choice for uh, <laughs> good work or bad matches. I think, yeah, I think that's pretty good. Going- you think about like some of the big stiffs or over the hill guys Randy Savage had to work with that he managed to get something decent out of. Like there's like that match, I think it's on the network of him wrestling Bruno in like eighty eight or eighty seven, maybe because I think he was a he was a heel still. So but it's like, yeah, then like Bruno can't do much, but they have a good match because the crowd's really into it and and Savage is great and Bruno's still good at what he can do. It's like so, so it's definitely like I feel like it's mostly George Steele to blame here because if you look at all the big stiffs uh, that Randy Savage managed to get good stuff out of over the years, George Steele is kind of an outlier there. Yes. He, yes. <laughs> A lot of that early Macho Man stuff in WWF is him trying to get good matches out of guys who can't go anymore, like Ivan Putsky. <laughs> yes, for sure. All right, well, moving on to my first choice, I'm going to start with a good family man. Just loves his kids, loves his one wife, his only wife, <laughs> only woman for him. That being Chris Jericho. And I picked a more recent match because I remember being like angry at this. He had a match with uh, a man now known as John Moxley at one point was called Dean Ambrose. Uh, like two months before Dean Ambrose won the WWE Championship, he and Chris Jericho had a match called an Asylum Match. Hmm. It was trash. It was a cage with weapons. Yes. So you would think, okay, Jericho, good, still at that point, I think was considered as a good worker. Uh, Dean Ambrose, good worker. Cage match should be fine. And you got weapons. So even if the match isn't great, you do some garbage wrestling. They barely used any weapons. It went like 35 minutes. (laughs) And then the one redeeming thing was Jericho went into thumbtacks at the end but like and this is like we're, we're heating dean up he's about to win the title and that's what we do we haven't go we haven't have a terrible boring 30 minute match with chris jericho in a cage with weapons where they don't use most of the weapons so that sucked yeah i i remember one of those weapons being a potted plant 
yet most of that feud was around uh, Dean Ambrose having a potted plant on the set of his talk show and uh, Jericho breaking it. Uh, so yes, that was Extreme Rules 2016. Jericho versus Dean in an asylum match for the honor of a potted plant. Okay. No argument here. And I purposely didn't pick Jericho because obviously that's the one that me as well. Uh, we, ha- <laughs> we have some overlap. Uh, we, we both chose two of the same guy. We both picked Brett and Sean among our five guys. So do you want to do the overlap first here? Sure. Uh, yeah, let's start with Sean. All right. So I have two, and I was going to pick one, whichever one you didn't pick. Okay. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. All right, so here's mine. Sean Michaels versus Triple H in a Hell in a Cell match. All right. Those guys went like an hour, and it is the most boring match. Like, it shouldn't be possible. Triple H, good worker. When he's in there with the right person, can be a great worker. Shawn Michaels, one of the three or four best guys to ever come through World Wrestling Federation Entertainment, etc. They wrestled forever, and it's so boring. I don't understand. It's it's meant, and they try to play it off as this big epic culmination of this Triple H Sean rivalry that's been going since Sean returned in 2002 and it's just boring and it sucked. That's my pick. What about yours? All right. So the first thing I had written down here is Sean versus Triple H bad blood, 2004 hell in a cell (laughs) 47 minutes, 26 seconds. Oh my God. I, I was I thought I was being over dramatic when I said it went an hour, but it practically did. And no. forty seven minutes twenty six seconds. So this was also, you know, awkward to talk about now, but this is Benoit was the champion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he was getting one of those CM Punk Rob Van Dam mid card champion pushes mm-hmm. where the real main eventers were still working main events and the champ was wrestling Kane in the middle of the card. <laughs> As this tradition, yes. Yes. Daniel Bryan, CM Punk. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's just what they do. Um, So, yeah. So you had the the double insult there of the world champion working underneath this horrendous, boring, long, bloody match on top. Yep. But uh, my obvious, the other obvious choice with Sean is his comeback match in Saudi Arabia with Triple H against Kane and the Undertaker. Jericho yeah. called the worst match in WWE history. I don't think it's that, but it sucked. Triple H tore his peck. Sean did a moonsault and landed on his head on the floor. <laughs> Not even in the <laughs> ring. He landed on his head on the floor when neither Kane nor The Undertaker, both legit like at least 6'6", six, six, mm-hmm. could not catch him. They just dropped him. Like he falls into them and they just like don't catch him and he just drops he just like slides down onto his neck. <laughs> he landed on his head on the floor. Incredible. That match sucks. Kane's but... mask fell off at one point. Yes, his mask and wig. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep, uh, Triple H got hurt, guy's wig fell off, uh Sean almost busted split his wig. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Uh, so I was going to go with, uh, the Hell in a Cell as well. And, uh, so I had a backup plan there. Nice. Yeah. I I will say I definitely considered that as well, but I felt like it was almost cheating because of how, how, (laughs) how bad it was. Sure. Like it's bad in different ways, but I was like, this is, I felt like the Hell in a Cell stands out more to me because, these those guys were in their prime main event of a pay per view, a real pay per view, not a Saudi house show pay per view, and that was what they did. So, but yeah, both both equally terrible in different ways. All right. So the other overlap we have is we both picked Bret Hart. That's so, right. So I've also I've also chosen two. And I'll go. I'll zig if you zag. 
fair enough. So I think we may also be on similar wavelengths here. Because again, I, I went back and forth between two choices. But again, I chose Brett when Brett was still Brett. And I, I picked his match with Bob Backlund at WrestleMania 11, the I Quit match. Which ended when Bob Backlund said, Wah! <laughs> he didn't say I quit. <laughs> he said, Wah! And then, like, like Wario, like Wario from the Super Mario Brothers games, he said, Wah! And that's how that match ended. It was a bad match. It's to date, I think, the only bad Bret Hart match, other than maybe the one you're going to mention, that I've ever seen. And it was Brett in his prime, and he was working with a guy who was on top in 1980. Can you imagine if somebody that was on top like 20 years ago came back and was at, was treated as like a serious threat to a current top guy in, in 2020? Wouldn't that be ridiculous? Yeah, that would be silly. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was, it was a bad match. Nobody wanted to see Brett wrestle this old fart and... It was a. It wasn't a good match. Roddy Piper was there as the special ref, and God bless Roddy Piper, but he didn't help things. <laughs> and then, as I mentioned, the finish was to the I Quit match was neither man said I quit, but Brett. Brett also didn't win with a sharpshooter. He won by tr- kind of putting Backland in the crossface chicken wing, uh-huh. and then Roddy Piper just decided that <laughs> that it was over. <laughs> Sucked. Whole thing sucked. <laughs> Roddy had his good days and his bad days. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Maybe that was a bad day. Yeah. Yeah. They, I have not watched that match since I rewatched all the WrestleManias like 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was not fresh in my mind. A match that I was there live for um, was my second choice, actually, which is like the obvious one, which is Brett versus Vince at WrestleMania yes. 26. That was my other choice. Apparently that match only went 11 minutes and 9 seconds. It felt like it went hours in the building. <laughs> um, yeah. Spe- and, you know, Brett couldn't take any bumps. And Vince took like a doomsday device or something from Tyson Kidd and uh, Davey Boy Smith Jr. And mm-hmm. he also landed right on his head on the floor at one point. <laughs> Um, so that's a choice, but I also like one that I think is kind of sneaky, um, Brett versus Sting at Halloween Havoc 98, which obviously that shows infamous because of the Hogan Warrior match on that show, which was also abysmal, but Brett in 1998, you know, it wasn't 1995 Bret Hart. It was going out there and having bangers with guys like Hakushi and stuff like right. that. But Brett was still good in 1998. This is, mm-hmm. you know, pre getting kicked in the head, pre concussion and sting sting gets a lot of flack um, in certain circles for not being, I don't know, not being a draw or not being a great worker or anything, but sting had a lot of really good matches and sting sure was definitely did. a guy who you put him in there with somebody who could lead him. And Sting could have a great match. Mm -hmm. So you watch their match at Halloween Havoc 1998. It's just a disaster. It's boring. It's slow. Neither guy looks like they want to be there. And I have (laughs) no idea why. Is that the match that ends with, like, Brett hitting him with the bat and he passes out in the sharpshooter? Yes, that's correct. Okay. (laughs) And Sting has the goatee. That's, That's my defining memory of that, is the finish... And Sting having a goatee in the Red Wolf Pack paint. Yeah, it was like half yeah. ass a dream match at that point. Mm-hmm. And it absolutely did not deliver. Just a terrible that, match. Yeah, that was like that string. I feel like Brett came into WCW. He had the match with Flair right at the start. That's actually a pretty good match. Like, I like that match with him. And then, like, it was like, theoretically, you have a year, maybe two years worth of dream matches with Brett to do. You set up the Scorpion Deathlock versus the sharpshooter and it's just boring yeah yeah on paper that looked like one of their biggest cards ever like Mm -hmm. that was maybe the apex of wcw (laughs) and it was you know it was it was all downhill from that night i mean 
that was the show where Goldberg wrestled DDP and the cable company cut it off early because WCW <laughs> didn't tell them they were going late. So then they had to show the pay per view for free on TV the next night. And I don't know. Obviously, we're just like three months from the finger poke of doom at that point, And you get the Hogan Warrior mess on that show. It's just like that show. I was pumped for that show and it didn't deliver. So, so. yeah. Hey. And uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good uh, outside the box pick there. All right, so that's uh, our overlap. We now have two uh, unique choices. All right, I will go next with my uh, Ric Flair pick. And I there's really only one match I think I could pick for this. And it is for... Now, people remember January 4th, 2010. Everyone remembers where they were when the, the new Monday Night War started. Yes. But technically, they didn't actually start. That was a one-week special that TNA ran that night. They asked actually started on March 8th, 2010. And the main event of that first show, Hulk Hogan and the new John Cena of TNA Abyss versus <laughs> the new nature boy, AJ Styles, and the old nature boy, Ric Flair, was your main event of that show. And like they half-ass like, start the show with the match, and it goes like two minutes, and it ends in a DQ, and then there's like this is more of it's more because of Hulk Hogan that this is on this is the list. <laughs> um, but like, and then like the whole, whole rest of the show is everyone telling Hulk Hogan he's old and broken down and shouldn't go out there for the main event. They like reset it and say they're going to do the match again at the end of the show. So they do the match again at the end of the show. I think they still did a DQ finish again. <laughs> but it's like in the meantime, it's like Hogan and Flair both blade, and there's just two old out of shape men bleeding on each other while Abyss and AJ are trying to do, like, spots in the other corner. And it's just <laughs> it's just a mess. And, and it was, like, the most depressing thing. And it's not like it's not like WWE did, like, a full-court press. It's not like when they ran out, like, Adam Cole versus Matt Riddle and Candice versus uh, Shayna to counter-program AEW's first show. It was, like, a nothing WWE show on the other, on the other channel at that point. Uh, it's just, you know, whatever, normal week of WrestleMania build. So, like, this is a big, big chance for TNA to see some momentum. And, like, my defining memory of that match is just the two old fat men bleeding on each other. Like, it's just, it's it's real sad and gross, man. And it's like, and I, like, I understand Ric Flair didn't, didn't want to retire and Vince McMahon made him retire. Yeah. But to have the send-off that he had and then to come out of retirement for that match... I know he had done the Australia tour and all that, but like his first televised match since going out with Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania was him bleeding all over the place on Hulk Hogan and him and Hulk Hogan limping around the ring. It's just, it's just depressing. Now I is so the Hulkamania tour was before then. Yeah, that was like the lead up to him coming in because then he brought all of the people that worked on the tour into TNA because that's like Ken Ken Anderson and Sean Morley and all those guys that showed up, the Nasty Boys, of course. <laughs> like all those guys that showed up on the first few Hogan TNA shows were all like the people that had worked the Australia tour with them. I see, I see, I see. I just remember, obviously, I've never seen any of the matches from the Hulkamania tour. Dave Meltzer swears that Rick got like a four star match out of Hogan on one of those nights. <laughs> <laughs> Which I just remember, like, at the time before I knew he was a racist, uh, <laughs> be, being the biggest Hulk Hogan fan on God's Green Earth and watching that show and watching that match. And it was the first time where it was like, oh, he can't go anymore. It's like, yeah, yeah, like the Sean match is like the last great match of his career, and he was like 51 or whatever at that point, and or had just turned 52, I think. And then he had one more in WWE with Orton a year later, and like he wasn't good in that match, but he'd also torn his meniscus the week before, mm -hmm. and he could still move a little bit, but yeah, watching that TNA match, it was that was when it's like, oh no, it's over, <laughs> it's 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 over, he can't move it. <laughs> He he can't move anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. Unfortunately, Flair gets the flag. My other thoughts on Flair was like he he had a 
pretty good match with Jay Lethal in TNA, and he had a surprisingly good, if you don't mind, a hardcore wild brawl of two old men with head trauma with Foley. But then there was also like the match with Sting at the end there, where I think it's literally his last match where he like tore his rotator cuff. But I was like, that's like, I give him a slight pass on that because he actually literally got hurt in the match. Whereas the the one with Hogan, like I said, it's just, it was a cluster F anyway. And then it was a bad storyline because it was all, I guess, building to Abyss versus AJ Styles for the title or whatever. But of course, all, all the focus is on Hogan and Flair. Um, and it's just, yeah, it was just bad and sad. And just, yeah, I just remember the shot of Flair, Flair chopping Hogan and Hogan's like barely able to stand up on the ropes and they're both bleeding. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's depressing, man. That's a, that's a bad one. The, yeah, that was Flair's last match against Sting. And that one too, it's like, that's one where I was worried, like, is Rick going to live? <laughs> through the end of this match yeah yikes all right uh well, well now that i've sufficiently bummed everyone out let's uh let's continue on this light fluffy fun evergreen <laughs> show ethan now that we've uh <laughs> by the way you mentioned uh I've, this is a callback to last week's episode which was definitely not taped earlier tonight absolutely um, not uh um, when uh, you mentioned AEW doing Winter is Coming, I thought you were going to make uh, a uh, Katie Lee Birchall reference. Oh. <laughs> well, I'd forgotten that that was her name. Uh, didn't forget her, but I, I forgot <laughs> that was her DNA name. <laughs> I will never forget seeing her in person at WrestleCon. And she will I... be, oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> like you see her on TV and it's just like nothing special. Then you see her in person, it's like, <laughs> my God. <laughs> like th- the other one was was Caitlin. I forget what her real name is, Celeste Bonin or whatever. Bonin Bonin. Uh uh-huh. <laughs> like she's never someone that stood out to me. And then you see her in person, it's like, oh my word. Yeah, they're beautiful women. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Winter was like an 11 <laughs> out of 10, and Celeste was like a 43. <laughs> well, that's what a what a compliment to both of those. Whoa, ones. whoa! All right, now that I've set uh, myself back 35 years, sure, sure. Uh, I'll go with Kurt Angle, and obviously you could pick a lot of Kurt from his last WWE run, which is not really mm-hmm. fair, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I mean, nobody held a gun to his head and made him go out there and wrestle Baron Corbin on Monday Night Raw in January 2019 and lose in four minutes to the Deep Six, Corbin's <laughs> secondary finisher. But he sure did. Oh, man. I chose that one over the WrestleMania one just because I was in the upper deck for WrestleMania and was just trying to stay warm and wasn't really paying that much attention to his match with Corbin at WrestleMania. I'm sure that sucked, too. But the one on Raw, where he lost in four minutes to the secondary finisher, I thought is the worst Kurt Angle match I've ever seen. Yeah, that was a real... Uh, talk about depressing final runs, <laughs> which is apparently what this show is slowly <laughs> turning into. Um, yeah, that was that was a bummer. But yeah, I, I vividly remember to your point i remember him losing in three minutes to the deep six <laughs> i don't remember anything about the wrestlemania match uh other than that at the end i think they let him cut a promo after he lost to like say thanks or whatever and they yeah. played his music but like yeah it was uh but yeah it was it was definitely it was it was bad it was a bad time all right i'll just jump in with my last year because i think your yours is a little more original than mine uh I've only seen one bad edge match in my entire life, and it was against Randy Orton at WrestleMania this year. So that's my choice for good work or bad Ooh. match. Literally the only bad edge match I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, it was so bizarre because I'm obviously WrestleMania was a weird show, and you never know what could have been if if the pandemic didn't happen and that was in, and they got to just do a wrestling match in front of seventy thousand people. 
probably would have been pretty good. In fact, they had something resembling a wrestling match the following <laughs> month, and it was good. Yes. Um, so if they had just done that, it probably would have been. But instead, they decided to do like 45 minutes. <laughs> And it was just like slow brawling all around the WWE Performance Center. And they brawled into an office and they brawled into a gym. They did a weird spot where uh, I think they referenced the Benoit murder-suicide. Yes. Unclear if they meant to or not, but still that got past somebody. Yeah. So they either accidentally or on purpose referenced like (laughs) the worst thing that's ever happened (laughs) Yes. wrestling um and then on top of it yes it was bad and i did edge win with his stupid standing arm choke i i don't remember i think he did it and then like give him a chair shot or something to end it but he definitely he was trying to do the standing head and arm joke there was like there was the mystical land of, of march of 2020 everyone in their mother was trying to do a standing head and arm choke as their finish and uh, Edge was one of them. But yeah, that was awful. That was awful. Edge and uh, rock hard Jake Hager. <laughs> I forgot about <laughs> I forgot his nickname was rock hard Jake Hager. Like, oh. like it's, look, look, I feel like an Edge comeback is going to be a little bit uphill sledding anyway. And then <laughs> you're going to throw, oh, let's get a new finisher over <laughs> in the mix too. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was questionable. But, you know, everybody does, like, takes one MMA class and then decides that they want to hold as a finish. Also, this is for those who are, those guys who are, I don't know that Edge is this guy, but I get the sense that he is just from the company that he keeps. <laughs> I know the the Revival are, are this guy. They're like, the well, if you've never laced a pair of boots, you don't have, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't have the right to critique this business. Mm-hmm. No, I know not to try to get a new holdover as your finisher in the in the at, at WrestleMania. <laughs> like, how- remember when that Al Snow clip went viral like a year ago, yes. where he was talking about how like criticism. Nobody that hasn't done what I've done has the right to criticize me. It's like, mother effer, I'm not a chef. I know, but if you serve me <laughs> a bad meal, I can go. I didn't like that. That sucked. You should cook differently so that you make good food instead. <laughs> yes, i i got I got some some people big mad online about that. <laughs> <laughs> I started telling them why that was stupid. But anyway, you, Al Snow, yeah, Al Snow's one of those guys, and Al Snow's a guy too who's like gifted enough of a communicator that he can make a bunch of BS sound smart. And so dumb people think that it's smart. Nah, yeah, it's dumb. Hero thing. Yeah, it's a bunch of BS. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that was. But yes, back to, <laughs> I do remember reading an interview like the week after the match when Ed just was like, actually, I pretty much just seen positive thing, positive things about it. And, and then he went on like a ten minute rant about how Bret Hart called me and said it was the best match he'd seen in five years, and that Bret Hart's opinion means more to me than any anybody on Twitter. It's like, well, if you didn't care and you hadn't seen anything negative, I don't feel like you would have <laughs> felt the need to talk for 10 minutes about how Bret Hart told you it was good. But, all right, man. Whatever. Right. I like it. All right. I, I, I wish him well. But, yes. Yeah. He, I think he might be one of those guys. Yeah, I think, I think he's one of those guys. All right, and wrapping us up here, I have uh, Johnny Garangano, uh, Johnny Gargano, Uncle John, um, and I picked actually a match that happened the same week of your last pick, uh, the empty arena match with Tommaso Ciampa on NXT television. This might have been like one of the last weeks I watched NXT through, like start to finish, sure, <laughs> because even pre all of the sex pests. Uh, stuff like I was kind of wavering on my interest in NXT, yeah. Uh, but I watched the show and it was like an hour of whatever, and then this empty arena match went an hour, and I was like, and I knew it was going an hour going into it, so you would think I'd be like prepared for it. And then they're like, we're like 10 minutes in, and I'm like, okay, this has got to be almost over. And then I look, I like hit pause on the DVR for a second, and you see like 
there's like the red bar is how much you've watched and then there's the clear <laughs> bar next to it and there's yes. just like this giant chunk of gray that i still have to go around like oh no <laughs> so it went really long i'm i don't know this for a fact i'm just gonna guess that the match was agented by sean michaels because there <laughs> was a lot of there was a lot of feelings there's a lot of <laughs> A lot of drama, a lot of acting <laughs> in our near falls. And mm. to cap it all off, we're capping off this year-long storyline, multiple years, used to be best friends. Their dad, Triple H, told him they had to stop fighting after this match. So this is the end. And they end the match on a swerve where Aunt Candace turned heel. Which is really the heart of what I want <laughs> Why I hate this so much. Yeah. Yes, the match was too long. Yes, it was overly Shawn Michaelsy. Yes, it was very melodramatic and too long. But they turned my favorite, like my favorite NXT wrestler. The the if you build a baby face in a test tube, that is Candice LeRae, and they turned her heel because they can't. No one, not even our savior, Uncle Paul knows how to book a baby face in WWE. And so not only did we turn Johnny Gargano, who I thought was a you-can't-mess-this-up guy, but then in the end, in his big culmination of his feud with Tommaso Ciampa, we turn his wife too. And it's not that they aren't entertaining as wacky heels now, but it, it just, it's the same thing with Sami Zayn, man. It just makes me sad because they were so good at being baby faces. And... Candice in particular is was really one of my favorite people to watch and it just bummed me out and so it was like it was just like a perfect storm of a match that went too long that was too melodramatic for my taste too cinematic if you will and then <laughs> they turned my favorite wrestler heel <laughs> my favorite baby face heel uh so that's my that's my outside the box pick for my for my last spot here is John Gargano versus Tommaso Ciampa in an empty arena match that went too long and ruined my favorite wrestler. Well, for a lot of reasons, that's an excellent choice. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think it was bad. <laughs> it was too long, sure. And obviously, neither Johnny or Kansas should ever be a heel. Yeah. But, but, you know, we got to keep people in NXT so they're at least their 38th birthday. <laughs> So everybody's gonna everybody's gonna have a run as a heel. That's that's the Kevin Nash line, right? You have to be you have to be in this business for like thirty six years before you can be a star, <laughs> right? In the big time. That's I right. think he said ten years in real life. Was, <laughs> what's his quote? Was you got to be a star for for ten? You got to be in the business for ten years before you can be a real star. This guy who worked in a company with Bill Goldberg, by the way. <laughs> Oh man! This is yeah. a guy who plotted with Hulk Hogan to kill Goldberg's career. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, Goldberg had only been a star for two years, so I mean, <laughs> if Nash didn't get him, you know, his lack of experience surely would have. <laughs> so bad. They so... were booing him occasionally. That meant it was time to beat him. <laughs> Sorry, we're getting off track. <laughs> this is about this is about Aunt Candace, not about Kevin Nash. No, Kevin. The show's Ke favorite. Yes, exactly. Collectively, Kevin Nash is our show's favorite wrestler. And as it turns out, he's uh, something of a woke political icon now. That's right. He once called a Trump supporter a super cracker. <laughs> Greatest right. tweet I've ever seen. <laughs> All right. All right. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. And until next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Yeah, I didn't really mean to go off on a, like, a...
three minute rant about Katie Lee Birchall and Kate, <laughs> but it's just kind of just... <laughs> stream of consciousness. It's a free flowing discussion that occasionally touches <laughs> on mature topics. Holy moly. <laughs> I do just like the idea that you were like, that woman could walk by, like, before you saw them in person, you're like, that woman could walk past me on the street. I wouldn't turn it out. I wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> bet. And I saw them. I'm like, oh, that woman is attractive. <laughs> well, hello there. <laughs> woman who is, like, predominantly known for being a professional pretty woman on television. <laughs> oh, she, she's actually pretty good looking. <laughs> who the fuck it? I don't know why you turned into Jimmy Stewart in my impression of you. But... I don't know. That's okay. <laughs> you got to do something. Yeah. Conan O'Brien is going to have a wonderful variety program on HBO Max coming out. Like, all right. Like, obviously, he's bored. Like, he's been bored for quite some time. Mm-hmm. I still don't understand if, like, your life's goal was to be. David Letterman and Johnny Carson rolled into one. Why you would want to be Jay Leno? <laughs> Isn't it great? <laughs> Isn't it some Shakespearean stuff, man. It's like the hack who he stayed around to. Like when you say Jay Leno, do you mean that he's leaving his successful thing to start a weird, like alternative? thing that's basically going to be the same thing but under a different name or that he's yes. just staying around too long well I don't necessarily think he stayed around too long I just I I don't know I don't know I haven't paid enough attention to him in the last five years or so to know does he no longer want to be David Letterman and Johnny Carson and he just wants to do new things or is he just, I, I, or is he being like politely shoved out the door and they're basically turning him into Jay Leno by giving him a variety show? <laughs> a wonderful variety show. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I thought about that. Like, he does his podcast now, he still has like his production company and they're producing stuff and he has the pot. And like, I feel like if it was that, like, if he really wants, maybe. He just wants to do his version of Letterman's thing where he just talks to people for an hour now instead of... But if you say variety show, that makes me think, well, there's still going to be skits and remote pieces and all that stuff. So, like, I don't know, man. Like, I like I would have thought, if anything, they would just, like, turn the podcast into the TV show and just do, like, long-form interviews with him and his bevy of, uh, you know, comedy friends. But instead, he's he's gonna do a wonderful variety show once a week. <laughs> yes. I mean, Sounds... I guess like HBO just needs like, and I mean, not that I think Conan is driving millions of subscribers the way that like, say, releasing the new Wonder Woman movie on it is going to drive subscribers. But I feel like there's also that thing where they're just like, we just need content. We just need okay, that's a new thing. People know that name. Throw him, throw him on a show here weekly. <laughs> There's definitely an element of that, sure. Um, I just, I, I don't, I, yes, everyone is of the mindset, well, we just, we need something exclusive, we need content, we need to fill out our streaming service. And it's just like, you've, you're just, it's a, sh- it's like the shell game. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. except for Netflix, like all of these giant mega corporations still on TV networks. <laughs> it's like, well, people were going to streaming because it was cheaper and there was stuff that's not on cable, but why don't you just put anyway, I think cable is still a wonderful value. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's brave of you to stick up for, <laughs> for the cable television industry. <laughs> I think you get more bang for your buck from the good folks at Xfinity <laughs> <laughs> than you uh, do with HBO Max or... Who? Well, I mean, I think we've talked about this for, like, years. I don't know if we talk about it in bonus features of our podcast, but, like, 
when Netflix was the only game in town or like, like it was like Netflix and Hulu, everything was on one of those two things and you could pay $8 a month and watch them. Yes. Now everything is the more splintered it gets. And it's, it's like Disney probably has the best, like that bundle they do with ESPN and Hulu and Disney all for like 15 bucks or whatever. Yes. Like that's the best yes. bundle, but like, I don't know that, but everything else, like the more splintered things get, um, you know, until we reach the, the logical conclusion of all of this, which is Disney just owning everything. And then there will only be one, one streaming service. But um, until we get to that point, like it's, it's just going to be like weird splintered off like this and Amazon will buy their exclusives. And then like Warner, Warner getting into it like three years too late. And then Apple doing an even worse job somehow <laughs> With their with their launch of basically just original stuff, I was like, yeah, this is this is all weird and <laughs> like, yes, it's, it's there's going to be all and everyone's like rushing to partner with a phone provider because then you can like everyone has like a different thing. Like, I think the poor people at T-Mobile were like, you can get Quibi for a year if you sign up with us. <laughs> I was like, um, yeah, no, this like it just gets more splintered and people just throw and television executives don't know what why things are successful so they just throw billions of dollars and hire every celebrity they see or know or have heard of (laughs) to be on their stuff and then you're like how did quibi lose 55 billion (laughs) dollars it's like well no one wanted to watch it and also you couldn't watch it on tv you could literally only watch it on your phone and they were seven minute long and nobody (laughs) liked it (laughs) and nobody watched it oh that's that's why it didn't work Right. So that's specifically why that failed. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I just, again, would like to extol the virtues of cable <laughs> television. Uh, I, for example, am uh, binge watching uh, seasons of Below Deck, uh, Below Deck Mediterranean, and Below Deck Sailing Yacht, all on Bravo On Demand, which is part of my Xfinity subscription. Mm. Interesting. So yeah, I do the uh, the YouTube TV, and it's I like the DVR. <laughs> that's okay. that's my I I like I haven't used any of the other ones. I haven't used Sling or Hulu Live or any of those. So I don't I can't confidently tell you that YouTube TV is like great compared to other streaming TV options. But the DVR is like basically unlimited. So that's, that's... kind of cool. So I can DVR every wrestling show and watch you know half of them and and fast forward through them and and i feel like that's that's useful would be nice if i mean if major league baseball we've had this discussion before but like that's that's the one drawback i think of streaming tv is that not all live sports are available to me um i think i think i think in some markets they do the like the local baseball team is the the regional cable is uh, on YouTube TV or Sling or whatever? Mm-hmm. I think it's just like specifically in our market we can't watch the Orioles or the Nationals on yeah on you on YouTube TV. All right, again, Xfinity. <laughs> I try to keep on keeping on.